So the next presentation is going to be given by Julian Alwood. Uh, Julian, do you hear me? This is Shubhashish. Great. Go, go I ahead, will Julian. Share my desktop. Can you see the first slide of my talk now? Yes. Yes, we see the slide very well. Okay. So thank you very much indeed for the invitation to join you tonight. And thank you for allowing me the eccentricity of appearing uh, remotely rather than in person. Uh, allowing me to stay in Cambridge to give this talk has saved the equivalent of about a third of the annual emissions of a typical person in the UK. Uh, and I think that's worth uh, coping with the, uh, the stress and uh, learning curve of working with this technology. So I'm sitting here in the UK, which is, of course, a very old country, talking to you over there in a very modern country, knowing that you're all wearing your lumberjack shirts, having come in from the fields of wheat that you grow in your enormous farmsteads. And when you come over here to the UK, I know that what you uh, think of us is about our history. We're full of history. It's what we're best at in the UK. Uh, whether it was good or bad history, it's what we're best known for. And we've got wonderful buildings like this. But unfortunately, I have to start tonight's talk by confessing to you that we also have a secret addiction. Here in the UK, despite the heritage and the glory of our buildings, we are absolutely hooked on white powder. And we consume white powder in a way that you can hardly imagine. We are absolutely... Uh, desperate to keep our fix of this white powder. In fact, we use 600 kilograms per person per year of cement. That's about 14 bags, roughly what you're looking at in the picture there. And we're equally hooked on steel. We use 500 kilograms of steel per person each year. This is a cast iron radiator. Um, and that weighs around about 160 kilograms. You'll know that if you've ever tried to lift one up. So three of those per year, or 14 bags of cement, is our addiction. But we're very clever about this. Despite being absolutely hooked, we're learning to hide it very carefully. And we hide it because we're very good at creating buildings and surfaces in our country which hide our dark secret. You can see here that we even managed to create grass with a special glow that uh, works particularly well when you're high on white powder. But behind the story there, if we look behind the front that we keep up when you come and visit us, you can see that we have a science of destroying our heritage and replacing it. And it's only when you understand how we're replacing it that you begin to get an idea of what we're doing with our addiction. Some of the pictures in this slide come from the city of Bath, where I first gave a talk along these lines a few months ago. And this is the site of a shopping center in Bath, which is about 35 years old. And as you can see, the citizens of Bath, who have a very proud heritage, have completely eliminated it in order to be able to replace it with a bright new shopping center of the same size. Uh, you can see there's some of the steel and the uh, cement going in to make their new shopping centre. But Bath is a pretty small place. It's only got about 80,000 people in. So in Montreal, you're about 20 times bigger than them. So to try to give you some idea of scale, these are three recent buildings in the City of London, in the financial district. Uh, the one at the front is called the gherkin, which is the disgusting green thing you get in McDonald's burgers if you're ever so unfortunate as to go into one of those. Um, and each of those buildings, if you add up the total materials required to make them, that's roughly equal to the material consumption of the 80,000 people of Bath. So in other words, you in Montreal are consuming around about 60 buildings of that size every year, assuming that your consumption is the same as those of us in the UK. Um, I'm afraid to tell you that you're actually slightly worse addicts than we are, so your consumption is slightly greater than that. 
So you can see that what we're doing is hooked on white powder and steel. We are taking our glorious heritage and turning it into an ugly nightmare of concrete and steel uh, towers. And it won't be long of our current rate of addiction before we get to uh, historical cities that look like this. Now, I hope that the video will work. I have um, a video here to try to show you in detail uh, where we are hiding our addiction. This is from China. Um, and I'm going to have to ask for some help now because we've got the video locally, I think, as well as remotely. So, uh, Stuart, are you able to start the video? I can't hear you, so I think I'll start it locally and hope that this is uh, something that you can watch while you're there. Um, this is a video of construction. Julia, the video is rolling in the room. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Can you still hear me? Thank you. What you're about to see is the very latest of construction in China. And after a short introduction, the video is about two minutes long. You'll see a timer start on the left of the bottom left of the screen, showing the time taken to construct a 14-story modern building in China. What you need to know is that the units on the left of that counter are counting in hours. Julian, the video is done. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, so now back to, uh, can you see my next slide now? Can you see this slide? They're putting up the slide right now, Julian. Okay, thank you. So what you saw in the video is amazing uh, because you get an idea of just how much material we're using up to make a building like that. What's perhaps more scary about that is that in the UK, when we build buildings using those methods, they, we design them for one to 200 years, but at the moment we replace them after 40. Uh, the next user usually wants a different configuration, so knocks down the old building to produce a new one. I don't know the figures for Canada, but in China, they're knocking the buildings down even faster than that. So all those materials that you saw being brought to the site were actually discarded or will be discarded on average in about 30 years uh, if we follow present patterns. The graph on my chart here shows that unfortunately, there isn't much hope of things getting better as we get richer. The x-axis here shows wealth per person per year, uh, uh, income per person per year, and the y-axis, the vertical axis, shows the stock, in this case of steel per person. And what this shows is that as we get richer, we eventually stabilize it using around about 10 tons per person. Uh, of steel. You'll be pleased to know that Canada, you're the green line, so you're actually higher than all the rest of us. Um, so even though China is using a lot of steel at the moment to make new buildings, 
we in the developed world keep using more steel to replace our existing buildings, and we show no sign of slowing down. So we can start forecasting what will happen as China and India raise their stock levels from three tons per person in China and one ton per person in India to current levels. That gives us a basis for forecasting what we're going to need in the future. And the top curve of this graph shows that by the year 2050, then we'll be using around about double the amount of steel in the world that we're using today. We're using most of that steel in construction, but you can see on this picture, we're also using it to make vehicles, to make infrastructure, to make uh, final goods, and to make industrial equipment. And by now, I've drawn attention to our addiction. So maybe you're asking why we should worry about this. Should we care about being addicts of steel and cement? Well, in the UK, we've passed uh, a law in 2008 called the Climate Change Act, and that commits us to reduce our emissions from 1990 to 2050 by 80%. So by 2050, we are legally committed to emitting only 20% of the emissions we had in 1990. And that's a change that won't come about by a set of small actions. It's something which requires major change. Uh, big scale of actions. So if I look at all the emissions that we make in the world, you can see that roughly two thirds of emissions come from the use of energy and processes, a third are from agriculture, deforestation, and, uh, and waste, uh, biological waste. Of the energy emissions, a third are in industry, about a quarter in the use of vehicles, and about a third in the use of buildings, and a little bit in other. And within industry, it turns out that five materials dominate our emissions. So more than about 56% of all the world's industrial carbon emissions come from making just five materials, steel, cement, pla paper, plastic, and aluminium. And you can see that steel and cement dominate, which is why we're drawing attention to them. Now, how do we address this? How do we come up with this incredible cut in our carbon emissions? Well, every government in the world who starts to get the idea that climate change might be real tries to address this uh, problem by thinking that we'll invest in R&D and we'll come up with a magic new energy source. So we invest in wind turbines, bioenergy, solar cells, and so on. But unfortunately, we have a problem with them. And the problem is about energy density. The energy density of our fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, is very great. The gas figure looks rather low here, but that's because this is gas at the surface. Gas in storage underground is about um, 350 to 400 watts per cubic meter per year. Uh, now, in the UK, we're using around about five kilowatts per person. That's our steady rate of power consumption. You'll be pleased to know that you're well ahead of us. It's 10 kilowatts per person in Canada. Um, but we have a lot less land than you do. Uh, my slide has an error there. We actually require one and a quarter watts, not five, one and a quarter watts per square meter if we covered our whole country in energy generation. And if we look at the data for that, then offshore wind in the UK generates an average of three watts per square meter. Solar cells, top of the range solar cells available today generate about five, and biofuels generate about a half. So you can see that compared to one and a quarter watts per square meter, we have a very great problem implementing a solution based on renewables. It's not that it's impossible, but if you think about how much the public objects to each new wind turbine or each new solar farm, you can see it's an uphill struggle to get to the point that a quarter of the surface of our whole country is committed to power generation. I don't think it's going to happen. So what that says is that if we want to make a difference, we have to use less energy. We aren't going to find a magic source of energy to take the problem away. And the good news is that in vehicles, we actually know how to do that. Um, I only caught a little bit of Tim's talk just now, but I think he talked about this. And um, this car is what I believe is the car of the future. You can find out about it on Volkswagen's website. It's called the L1 concept car. It meets the safety standards of Europe at the moment. It weighs 380 kilograms, and it does 190 miles per gallon. 
And the reason it does it is because it's small. If you look at a graph here, this is the graph of all the cars on sale in the UK at the moment. Up the y-axis, we've got fuel consumption. On the x-axis, we've got the weight of the vehicle. And you can see that if you want a low energy consuming vehicle, you need a small light one. It's as simple as that. So low energy cars are small. And if we switch to that, we could easily switch to a 200 miles per gallon transport system. With buildings, we also have solutions. We know how to build passive houses, and they use less than 10% of the energy of current new build houses. So we've got ideas about how we can uh, reduce our energy demand to meet our emissions reduction. But what about industry? Industry is difficult. We've seen the figures that most of the energy is used in materials production, and you can see why we use so much here, because these are high temperature processes which also release CO2 during the chemical reactions. And because they're high energy, the managers of those businesses have spent the last 150 years trying to optimize them. Here's the history of global steel production over about 40 years. And you can see that the average performing steel plant is reaching something close to a plateau here. Best practice is still ahead, and that depends on the investment in new uh, equipment, really. Uh, so China has the best performing blast furnaces at the moment. And if we look at global aluminium production, you can see, again, there's some improvement, but very little. And actually now the, uh, we've reached the plateau. The energy intensity of aluminium production is going up. And unfortunately, that means that we can't solve the problem of the emissions reduction in industry just by efficiency measures alone, by energy efficiency. What it means is that if we want to reduce the total emissions of industry, we have to use less new material. We call that strategy material efficiency, and it's not had very much attention, but it turns out there's a lot of space to play. We've been looking at this from a whole range of perspectives. Here's a familiar site. This is the I-beam used in all construction at the moment, but you can see that the one we're showing here is optimized. It's got more material in the middle compared to the edges, and this concrete beam also is optimized to track the bending moment diagram if you've done an engineering degree at some point. And these uh, designs of beams will save about a third of the material compared to what we have at the moment, and would, uh, the users of the buildings would see no loss of service. So that's a pretty good opportunity. But in the last couple of years, we've had a student sitting inside three of London's biggest design consultancies, looking at the designs of buildings going up today. What we asked was, let's compare the building as designed with the safety standards required in Europe. And we came up with what we called a utilization ratio, the fraction of the steel in the building that was actually required to meet the safety standards even though we know the safety standards are already conservative. What the designers told us was, we're pretty good at this, we're not going to waste material, so you'll find everything around about 80 to 90%. And you can see that what we found here is that large areas of the building are being used at only about a quarter of the steel is required to meet the European safety standards. And we repeated this for 23 different buildings. We looked at 83 floor pans in all. And on average in London, we are only using the steel, or we are using twice as much steel as is required to meet the safety standards. And that's a function of cost. It's cheaper to save labor than to save steel. So rather than designing buildings carefully, what we actually do is design the highest loaded areas and then use copy and paste on computer drawing packages to replicate that part of the building elsewhere. So there's a lot of opportunities to save steel just by better design before we do anything clever about optimized structures. But there's plenty of other things we could do as well. We could keep our buildings going for longer, 100 or 200 years or 500 here where I am in Cambridge, rather than uh, the 40 years that we're averaging at the moment. We could repair goods when they're broken rather than throwing away and replacing them. We could do something about the mountains of scrap. In the UK, we're generating about 10 million tons of scrap steel per year, and we're consuming about 13 million tons of new steel. So there are more efficient ways that we might be able to reuse old steel. 
To give you a flavor of what we've been doing about this, then one of the projects we've had has been to create a map of all the world's steel. This is a, a diagram showing the flow of steel. At the top left, you can see iron ore and scrap coming into the world and then being transformed by the steel industry and eventually turned into products on the right-hand side. And uh, you can find all of these slides later if you want to look in detail. And onto that, we've mapped um, three strategies that would uh, deal with the amount of scrap we generated and three that would allow us to use a lot less material, making things lighter or avoiding over-designing them, keeping things for longer, or using them more efficiently, using more of the capacity of what we have at the moment. In the UK, we have one car for every two people. Uh, I guess you might have even more there in Canada. The cars have on average five seats, but we're driving them only for four hours per week per car with an average of one and a half people in them. So quite clearly, we could live well with fewer cars if we use them more intensively. Well, I've had a project for five years, which ended at the end of uh, last year. And a couple of years ago, we wrote a book trying to summarize what we had learned about this. And this would be an appalling statement of marketing, uh, mentioning my book here. The name you can see clearly there, which you'll find on Amazon, is Sustainable Materials with Both Eyes Open but I'll excuse myself from the marketing because we're also giving it away for free. You can download the PDF of the book at withbotheyesopen.com and all the data that I've given here is there. Now, I think I have about five minutes left of my time. And where we've got to since publishing the book is to realize that we can't solve the emissions problem in industry using uh, energy efficiency, but we could make a difference using materials less we could live well with less material, but we're choosing not to do so. Usually what happens is that the clients want more material. Here's part of a study we did for the London Olympics. This is the aqua center. Uh, apparently the uh, shape in the middle there is meant to look like a wave if you're an architect and you're the sort of person who has feelings. Uh, but here we're engineers, so we uh, very much prefer the velodrome. Uh, now, we did a study and showed that the embodied energy for every seat in the aqua center was double the embodied energy in the velodrome. And in the end, the reason was that the customers for the velodrome said in the first line of their design brief, we want a lightweight building, where the customers for the aqua center said, we want a building with a dramatic signature roof. So if the client asks for a lightweight, efficient building, Actually, in engineering, we already know what to do. We rather like constraints. So if we can persuade the customer to constrain us, we're very happy. But unfortunately, that isn't what customers want to do. Without any use of Photoshop, the car on the right here is the original 1957 Mini, and the car on the left is the version available today. We don't want small cars, do we? We want the biggest car we can get with the most acceleration. That's what happens when we go into shops. And it's true of everything we do. The graphs on this slide are all per person. This is transport per person over 40 years. The blue line shows the number of uh, flights we take per person. And it's growing linearly. This is adjusted for the world population. This is per person on average in the world. Here's our use of materials per person in the year. Here's our ownership of cars and the amount of built space in red. Incredibly, the amount of built space per person is growing more than linearly uh, ahead of what is already happening with population growth. And here we are with inches of silicon and electric motors per person per year. We're ravenous for using energy-related products because they make us feel good. When we go shopping for a new fridge, before we go into the shop, we all say that we want to have a low-energy fridge and uh, the environment is important to us. When we go into the shop, we want the biggest fridge we can possibly get. And I know that you're pretty keen on big fridges over here, and you're infecting us over here as well. You can see that this fridge is so big that we can even store all of our dry goods that don't need to be refrigerated at all in the door just to make good use of the space. I think we've got a problem here, and the problem comes down to the fact that we've used energy as a substitute for labor. We also use money as a substitute for labor. 
And what we all know is that we like having people working for us. The more servants we have working for us, the better, the, the, the richer it makes us feel. But I think the problem that we've got is that we've narrowed down our measures of our economy and of our personal lives as if personal income, our salaries, and at the national level, our GDP, measured things that we value. Since I started thinking about this, I've been doing a study of gravestones, and this is one from a cathedral in the UK. And if I read out a little bit in the middle here, whoever this man was, what his epitaph on his stone says is, as a tradesman and editor of a public newspaper, he was deservedly esteemed for integrity of contact, conduct and consistency of principle. And maybe it was a Canadian newspaper. I don't think we think that of our editors in the UK at the moment. As a father and friend, his memory will long be cherished in the hearts of those who, as, the best they, as they best knew, can best appreciate his claims to their lasting gratitude and sincere affection. I think that's saying something very much impo more important than salary and GDP about what we really value. I have a picture here about which I don't know the context. These are obviously people in India bathing in the Ganges. But when I look at that picture, I see a lot about relationships, about belief and identity, about tradition, history and community, and I see nothing about income. When I look at what we do with our leisure time in the UK, what we like doing is cuddling each other. And when I looked up what you like doing in Canada in your leisure time, I discovered that you also like cuddling each other, but with a lot more protective clothing on. Um, you call us inhibited and look at yourself. It's no wonder the birth rate's dropping. We like our heritage. We like so many things that we fail to value with GDP, and yet we've made that the single determinant of success in national policy. About 100 meters away from where I'm sitting, the great economist John Maynard Keynes, towards the end of his life, wrote a pamphlet called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. What he said in that was, for the first time since his creation, man, now that we've solved our production problems, will be faced with his real, his permanent problem. How to use his freedom from pressing economic cares how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him to live wisely and agreeably and well. And I think that's where sustainability is really at. And um, I have getting a little short of time, so this is what I'm doing at the moment, and the door is open for collaborating. Uh, the, the UK In Demand Centre is a big national activity I now run, and I'd be delighted to talk to you about that. Let me wrap up by saying <clears throat> there are, from what I've shown you and from everything I've looked at, there are no technology miracles that will create a sustainable future. There isn't a magic energy supply and there aren't magic energy efficiency solutions that will allow us to keep growing uh, because we're insatiable. There's no limit to how much more service we'd like to have. But I think we need to address that, our insatiability, rather than seeing this as the vision of our future. We can try to remember some of the benefits that we see when we visit our old towns and cities, our heritage and the ideas of community and craft that were built into them. And if we can recalibrate our idea of sustainability towards human values rather than to do with economic growth, maybe then there's a role for engineers. If we agree the constraints, then we can say, well, what's the best we can do with the remaining resources we allow ourselves? Perhaps as a last thought, then I think we have been so enamored of GDP and income that we've forgot some of the most important things to us. And looking for an image that captured that, I want to leave you with an expert on sustainable thinking that I found here. I think this chap has something very, very important to tell us. I can't remember being that age myself. But I can remember my parents telling me how much I used to enjoy bathing in the sink in our house. That isn't me, and I don't know who it is. But there's a joy there. There's an unbridled sense of what it is to be a human being that seems to me to have nothing to do with income or energy or money or materials. And if we could recalibrate our own personal and our public lives towards valuing what that bloke's appreciating, 
then and only then do I think we have a possibility of finding a sustainable future. Thanks very much.